Hi, I'm Rolf Perez with Shooter's Paradise. In a previous video, we discussed the five elements of self-defense. Attorney Andrew Branca has done a wonderful job of breaking up the difficult to understand and complex laws into five easily understandable elements. The elements of innocence, imminence, proportionality, avoidance, and reasonableness. So I wanted to take a deeper dive into this and discuss it in more detail. So the first element, innocence, just what exactly is that? Well, each state's going to have their own laws that, is, that are going to dictate uh, the mantle of innocence that we need to claim self-defense justification. You see, if I'm the bad guy, then fundamentally I shouldn't be able to claim self-defense justification for the bad thing that I did. So I need to be innocent. And in the state of Louisiana, there's a couple of things that they enumerate that uh, would remove that mantle of innocence from us. The one being, I can't be the original aggressor. I cannot be the individual who brought the difficulty upon my, myself. I cannot be the person who picked the fight in which the other person died and then claimed self-defense. I, I can't be the one that caused the, the problem. Uh, Ronald Gasser, in that appellate decision, we see uh, Ronald Gasser and Joe McKnight were in, get involved in a road rage incident, and Ronald Gasser was uh, shown to have been original aggressor material, and under the law, the original aggressor cannot claim self-defense. He is barred from claiming self-defense. And as we spoke in the other video, if that person has made an affirmative defense, as Ronald Gasser did, he said, yes, I did that thing, but I was justified in doing so. Well, once the court has decided, no, you meet the requirements of an original aggressor, then it's just, you're going to prison because you have lost the ability to claim self-defense justification. So you can't be the original aggressor. Um, another item that the state of Louisiana en enumerates that would prevent us from having the mantle of innocence that we need to claim self-defense justification would be being involved in the sale of narcotics, selling drugs. If I'm selling drugs, I can't claim self-defense justification. Uh, and there might be some qualifications on that that uh, would involve uh, study, but uh, hopefully anybody who's watching this video is nowhere near going to qualify for the moniker of a drug dealer. Okay, so moving along. Uh, innocence is actually fairly easy to establish in Louisiana. We just can't be the original aggressor, and this is why we teach our students to always put your hands up Number one, this is a great defensive position. Put your hands up, back up, and say, please, I don't want any trouble. And any video camera or any witnesses who see that, if they will say that, if the video camera will show that, it'll be tremendous for you to establish you're not the original aggressor. So the second thing is imminence. The threat has to be imminent. If the threat isn't imminent and about to happen, then I can't use force. I can't use force and claim self-defense justification. The threat has to be right here, right now. Well, how do we decide that? It's not some arbitrary thing. Uh, do you remember in school when you were a kid, uh, oftentimes uh, the fire department would come in and they would teach a lesson on fire safety and they would use a fire triangle to teach us about fire. A three-sided triangle and each one of the points was an element of fire. You have to have fuel, you have to have oxygen, and you need ignition or heat. You have to have those three things to have a fire. And so with this fire triangle, if you take away one of the things, if you take away oxygen, so it's just fuel and heat, you don't have a fire anymore. The fire goes out. You take any one of those three elements of fire out of the triangle and the fire ceases to exist. The same thing happens with our ability to use self-defense justification under the element of imminence. So take that same triangle and put ability, opportunity, and jeopardy on the three points of that triangle. Whoever is attacking me has to have the ability to kill me or do great bodily harm. If it's a, a lady who has just recovered from COVID 
and she's in her mid 90s and she's wheelchair bound and she holds her hand up and says, I'm going to beat you to death. Well, she doesn't have the ability to do that. Uh, as nice as she is, she's just not capable. So the ability, they, they need the ability to kill me. So they need a baseball bat, a gun, a knife, a uh, great physical size or uh, great skill. Uh, and, and that all has to be demonstrable. Uh, so <clears throat> the next element, the next point on the triangle is opportunity. They have, the op they have to have the opportunity to put that into play. They, they have to be physically near me to shoot me. They have to be really close to me to use a knife on me. Uh, I, can't, I can't have somebody call me on the phone and say, I'm going to kill you. I've got a knife and I'm going to stab you to death. And they're three miles away and claim that it was an imminent threat because it's not an imminent threat. They have to have the opportunity. They have to be there. If there's a chain link fence separating us and they have a contact weapon like a baseball bat, it's not an imminent threat. Now, if they were on the other side of the chain link fence and they had a gun, that's an imminent threat. The bullet would go right through the fence. So the other item on the three points of this triangle is jeopardy. Have they shown that my life is in jeopardy? Who? Courts have held that words by themselves don't qualify. They can't just say, oh, I'm going to kill you. I'm not doing anything. My hands are down at my sides. Oh, I'm going to beat you to death. I never take a step toward the person. I'm 10 feet away from them. Never take a step. Never move my hands. Never do anything. That's not an imminent threat. Words alone are not sufficient. There has to be words and action or action by itself. An upraised knife coming at me. Well, yeah, that qualifies. Okay, so they have to have ability, opportunity, and jeopardy. All three parts of that make up the element of imminence. The threat has to be imminent. Take away ability. They no longer have a knife or a gun or a baseball bat. There's no longer an imminent threat. Take away jeopardy. They've never, like law enforcement officer, I can see he's got a gun. He's got the ability to kill me. He's right there in McDonald's with me. He's got the opportunity to kill me, but he's done nothing to show that my life is in danger. My life, there's no jeopardy toward me. The element of imminence is not there because the third part of the triangle is not there. By the way, that's one of my arguments against open carry is that you're giving away two of the elements of imminence to somebody who would like to defend themselves against you. I don't want to be giving away elements of this uh, triangle of imminence. Okay, moving on. Proportionality. My response has to be proportional to them. If somebody comes up to me and pushes me, I can resist the push with a push, but I cannot take uh, an iron, cast iron skillet and smack them upside the temple for the push. That's not appropriate. That's not proportional. Uh, courts have held that fists are not deadly force. So I can't use a knife or a gun against somebody who's simply coming at me with fisticuffs. Uh, and now there could be an exception to that. There's always exceptions to anything. And that exception would be that I know that this person like, is Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson is coming up to me with his hands up. Oh yeah, I can use a gun because it's demonstrable. And I know that Mike Tyson can kill me with a punch. All right, so that there's always exceptions to different things. Anyway, proportionality. I, if I'm, uh, I'm 6'3", 250 pounds, my wife is five foot. She's you know, nowhere near as big and strong. I'm a male. I have testosterone. She has estrogen. I can't say she came up to me and put her dukes up, so I had to shoot her because she could kill me, and she said she was going to beat me to death. I can't do that. It's not proportional. It has to be proportional. So that's the third element of proportionality. The first one, innocence. The second element, imminence. The third element, proportionality. The fourth element is avoidance. I need to avoid the conflict. This is a sticky one, particularly in the state of Louisiana because we have stand your ground laws. So also the castle doctrine. And I hate to use those terms because people don't, they misunderstand what those terms mean. Stand your ground is wherever I am out in public, I don't have to run away from a threat 
but I can stand my ground and meet force with force. And that's proportional. Uh, castle doctrine is if I'm inside my home, I don't have to flee out of my home. I can stay in my home and meet force with force in my home. So <clears throat> avoidance. There's an interesting case, State versus Wells. The citation for that is 209 South 3rd 709. It's a Supreme Court decision from 2015. Uh, and it, it is pretty interesting because it addresses this very well. So 1420C, Louisiana Revised Statutes 1420C is the standard ground provision. And it says, uh, paraphrasing, that uh, if I am in a place where I have a right to be, and I'm not engaged in illegal activity, I have a right to stand my ground and meet force with force. I don't have to run away. Then 1420D, paraphrasing of course, says that a jury, the finder of fact, can't consider the possibility of retreat in determining whether or not I actually believed my life was in danger. So <clears throat> these two are pretty, pretty powerful protections uh, in the state of Louisiana. The stand your ground provision, uh, I, I can stand my ground when I'm out in public and meet force with force if I'm in a place where I have a right to be. Uh, I can't be in somebody's house that I haven't been invited into. Hmm, I wonder about going into the backyard and borrowing the neighbor's lawnmower without permission and unlocking his gate to get in there because I know the combination. And I never was actually given permission to go get his mower, but I do it. And so I go get his mower and something happens and I'm in his backyard. Did I have a right to be there? Hmm, that's a tricky one. The other part of it is I can't be engaged in any illegal activity. Well, what's illegal activity? Someone, you gotta say, selling drugs. Everybody always says, selling drugs, absolutely, that's illegal. And by the way, that's exactly what happened in State versus Wells. He admitted that he was there to buy marijuana. So <clears throat> I can't be involved in crime. I can't be involved in illegal activity at the time in order and, and retain my right to stand my ground. So just what exactly is illegal activity? Unfortunately, we don't have a definition. You see, we know that purchasing drugs ranks up there because that was shown in that appellate decision. The court said this qualifies for him to lose the standard ground provision. Huh. What about other things? What other kinds of crime are there? Driving without a license? Driving with expired insurance? Carrying a concealed firearm without a permit? Oh, well, I have a permit, yeah, but what if the date on my permit is expired and I didn't check? Have you ever uh, realized you're about to have an expiration on your driver's license and you had no clue that was coming up and, oh man, I gotta get that taken care of? Yeah, these things can sneak up on us. So do those things qualify as the illegal activity that would cause me to lose my stand, my ground provision because I was engaged in illegal activity? Hmm, we don't know. I don't want to be the test case, and I'm sure you don't either. So if my whole self-defense claim hinged on the fact that I was not engaged in any illegal activity at the time, I would be terrified. There are so many laws, and it's so easy to break a law, and we don't have a clear understanding yet of what that exactly entails. Eventually, the Supreme Court hopefully will rule on that and will know, but at this point, we don't. Uh, so then the other aspect of this is 1420D, the jury cannot consider uh, retreat, the possibility of retreat in determining whether or not you really believe that your life was in danger. So <clears throat> the, in, the, in this case, State versus Wells, what happened was that the appellate court said, well, he loses, Chris Wells loses his right to stand your ground because he was there to buy drugs. But when he loses stand your ground, he also loses 1420D, which is a jury can't consider the possibility of retreat in deciding whether or not you thought your life was in danger. 
So Chris, his defense, kind of, that was an important part of his defense that he thought his life was in danger. But Chris went back to his car. Some witnesses say he left the parking lot when in the car. Others say he just went to the car and came back. Anyway, he, he left the place where the guy he ended up killing, Big Herb, where that guy was. He left that place, went to his car. He came back with a gun. So in this case, the jury, because he lost Stand Your Ground, was now able to say, we don't believe that you actually thought your life was in danger. Because if your life was in danger, you would have left. You wouldn't have come back. You would have been scared and you would have left. So we can see that it's the ground for Stand Your Ground is tenuous. There's a lot of conditions on it. And I don't want my self-defense claim to hinge on that because if it hinges on that then uh, I might lose that and if I lose that I go straight to prison so let's avoid every conflict we can let's not say I have stand your ground so I'm gonna stand my ground let's try to avoid as much as we can and only respond with force when we're absolutely forced into it so, innocence, imminence, proportionality, avoidance, and finally, reasonableness. The element of reasonableness is made up of two parts, both objective and subjective. So the objective part of reasonableness is what we call the reasonable man standard. What would a reasonable and prudent person have done in the exact same situation, knowing what you knew at the time? It's quite a standard. So <clears throat> I like to ask students if they set the parking brake in their car when they came to class. And uh, inevitably, no one set the parking brake if they have an automatic transmission in their car. And I always say, well, you do realize that a reasonable and prudent person would have set the parking brake. The reasonable and prudent person isn't the average person. It's kind of the ideal person. It's a much higher standard than we would like to consider oftentimes. So the first part, what would a reasonable and prudent person do? So that's the element I'm describing there, a reasonable and prudent person, not a careless person. Reasonable and prudent person always looks before he leaps. He always looks in the side window of his door for cyclists before he opens his car door to get out of his car. Hmm, always sets the parking brake. Always checks the back seat because there could be a kid who's gotten into his car on his drive to work before he got in the car in the morning and he didn't know. Always check to make sure there's no children in the car. Pooh, tough standard. What would a reasonable and prudent person have do in the exact same situation? So the second part of it is the situation has to be exactly the same. It was a dark and stormy night. He was wearing dress shoes. The concrete, the pavement was slick under the leather sole of the dress shoes. He couldn't run. That's important. The exact same situation. Hmm. Yeah, that can be really important. Knowing what he knew at the time. First part, what would a reasonable, prudent person have done? Number two, second part. In the exact same situation. Number three, knowing what you knew, the defender knew at the time. Well, I happen to know that the guy who's attacking me has attacked and killed four people in the last three years. And he's killed them even though they gave him everything that he asked for. I can take, I, I can have a pretty high certainty that this individual could kill me at the end of this too. It would be a reasonable belief. Well, I happen to know this individual is a karate expert because I just watched him kick four kids in the head and send them flying across the parking lot. Yeah, I'm not going to let him kick me. So what would a reasonable and prudent person do in the exact same situation knowing what you knew at the time? That's objective reasonableness. Then subjective reasonableness would be, did you really think your life was in danger? So you have to have the belief, and the belief has to be reasonable. 
it's not just enough for that to be a reasonable belief, but did you actually believe that yourself? So it's a two-part test, this reasonableness thing, and it gets applied to the other four elements. Innocence, imminence, proportionality, avoidance, and reasonableness. The element of reasonableness is a filter that we look at the other four items through. So <clears throat> it's pretty, pretty important. In 1420D, as we spoke a minute ago, we see that that law protects us from a jury where he says he must not have thought his life was in danger because he didn't run away. They're not allowed to say that. They're not allowed to assume your uh, subjective holding of the belief because you failed to retreat. And, and this would be, if someone's really scared they're about to die, they're going to take certain actions. They're going to avoid it if possible. They're not going to, oh yeah, what did you say? They're not going to do that. They're going to get out of there if they think they're actually about to die. So these are the five elements and a little deeper dive into them. Innocence, imminence, proportionality, avoidance, and reasonableness. Those five things, all five have to be there for me to win a claim of justification and be found not guilty. It's a lot. It's complex. And there's even deeper layers into this stuff. Hopefully that gives you a little primer and uh, hopefully you take take some knowledge away from there and it makes you harder to convict. Thank you.